evolution and ecology are really tied together. So we're still on evolution here, but when we study the overall dynamics and effects that organisms have within a given area, that's ecology. Okay, so the same principles apply. And now when we study ecology, we look at various factors to ultimately determine the stability of that ecosystem. Now there's multiple ways in which we can study ecology. If we remember back from lecture one where we studied the biological organization of life, it started with atoms and then to molecules. I'm not going to write the whole list. But kept going down until we got to the end where we study populations, communities, ecosystems, and then the biosphere. So these are the highest levels of organization of life that we study. So now we're at the tail end of our list where we're looking at populations, communities, and ecosystems in terms of living systems. Because in reality, uh, it's just a more complex uh, organization. Um, so let's define these, and then we're going to spend all of lecture 18 today and Thursday talking about what uh, population ecology is, why it's important, why we study it. Because in reality, the main purpose for studying these is to understand whether or not an ecosystem is thriving or failing. Now, if you haven't learned our dependence upon the stability of ecosystems yet, you will definitely get that here at the tail end. Why? Well, as we've talked about, we're not autotrophs. And the law of entropy is always in play, which means that energy is constantly being lost, which is where our dependence upon the sun comes into play. Without this influx of energy, you and I wouldn't be here. So the food in which we eat and the ecosystems that they are part of are crucial for your and I's survival. Which is why studying ecology and understanding uh, its role is extremely important. Because ultimately, as consumers, we need those autotrophs. We need those photosynthesizers to survive and to do well. well you can't just have photosynthesizers in an ecosystem. There needs to be a system of constant recycling and things. And this is where decomposers come into play and play their respective roles. So as we start talking about ecology, you're going to see me throwing various plants, animals, fungi, the various organisms that we've learned about into these various groups and look at their ecological role and how vital they are. And this is why we're concerned about climate change and things of that sort it's because of the stability can be very easily disrupted of these ecosystems. So let's define these, what they are. Population, let's recap. A population is a group of the same species occupying the same geographical area. That doesn't mean that's the end all of all of that species. For example, there can be multiple populations of a species spread out throughout the world. Obviously, the more spread out a species is, the greater the chances they have of survival, which is why humans are going to be around for quite a while. But other species aren't so lucky. Some species have very restricted populations because they cannot survive just anywhere. They can only survive where the temperature is right and the precipitation is right and they have the right dynamics as far as the, the ecosystem is concerned. And when these organisms have a change in their environment, they very easily can go extinct. And that will be the last concept we cover in this lecture on Thursday, is how do we predict extinction and what can we do about it? What are the factors that ultimately contribute to the extinction of a species? And what are the ramifications of the extinction of that species? Community. When we look at a community, we don't just study one species at a time, we look at all of the species in that given area at one time, which is why it's the next level of complexity in studying biology, because it's obviously much more complex to look at all of the living components of an environment and how they interact with one another. But that'll be for lecture 19. And then ecosystems. This is where we not only look at the living components, which is all life in an area, but also the non-living components, such as nutrient cycling, water cycling, 
uh, energy flow, things that are vital for the stability of an ecosystem, but we look at everything. We look at all components, living and non-living, of a particular area. And so that's why ecosystems, again, are the next level of complexity. Now, we're not going to spend a considerable amount of time on the biosphere because this level of study is the whole Earth, looking at how all terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems interact with one another, which is a huge endeavor to look at tidal currents and energy distribution and all these factors that play a key role, which is why um, the better our science is, the better our models of prediction of what might happen and what will happen uh, related to uh, uh, climate change and other uh, factors that are uh, important for us to understand. So, population, community, ecosystem, these are the three last levels of complexity that we study in any biological system. Now, let's start with population ecology. What is it that scientists study when they study an individual species? The ultimate goal of studying the species is pretty much to determine whether the species is thriving or whether it's on the decline. Okay? And so we look at reproductive rates, we look at population distribution, we look at various factors to ultimately give us an assessment. It's, it's basically a simplified version to help us understand whether or not um, or what's happening to the species in that environment. And it tells us quite a bit especially just looking at the distribution of the species in the environment, tells us quite a bit about the conditions of that environment. So let's look at the three types of distributions, and then I'll show you a video which illustrates one of these very well. The first one is a random distribution. Now, the picture is showing a lichen. Um, you remember a fungi and an algae together. Random distributions are typically uh, observed when there is an abundance of resources. Now, resources isn't just food. Because remember, the lichens, they can get food anywhere as long as there's sunlight. The algae can photosynthesize and produce food for the fungus. And so it doesn't matter where they sit on the rock or where they are in that particular area. There's food everywhere because there's sunlight everywhere. Also, there's plenty of space. So they're not restricted to one area or another, which is why their distribution is random. So if we see a random distribution with no pattern in it, that usually tells us that there's an abundance of resources. A uniform distribution is the opposite. Ultimately, this is because of competition for resources. Space is a resource as well. Penguins, as shown here, have a, yes, they're kind of clumped together, but they also have that uniform distribution. You'll find this even with plants. Plants get too close to one another, they start competing over resources, space for their roots, food, nutrients, water, and the like. So you'll find that when a species tends to start spreading out and have this uniform distribution, there's usually some competition over a vital resource, be it space, food, water, and the like. It can also be a territorial thing within the animal kingdom, other kingdoms without that neurophysiological response don't have a territory issue, so to speak, um, but animals typically do. So it might not be a, uh, necessarily a resource, but it could be a territorial, which in, in a way is still space issue, but uh, it's not that they're running out of space, it's just, it's just part of our nature. Now, the clump distribution has a wide variety to it. So this is the one where you're going to have to pay particular attention where there's a lot more than just these others. Now, clump distribution you typically find when the species is localized around the nutrients, like an oasis. So in an oasis where the water is found, you're going to find an abundance of life because that's where the resources are at. So when you get that clump distribution, that's because that's where the resources are at. Um, another thing, especially for the animal kingdom, and it, and it occurs for the plant kingdom as well, but the closer you are to one another, the more reproductive success you have. So when you're close with those of your species, you have a greater chance of reproductive success. So that's another reason for a clump distribution. Now, animals typically travel in packs or herds or murders, like with crows. Uh, how they came up with the murder of crows, I don't know. Um, but these various groups have an advantage. If you're typically the prey, they have the advantage of the protection of the group, protection for the young and protection for each other. So animals uh, that are typically 
um, vegetarians and not carnivores or whatnot, um, they ultimately protect their young from the predators that would normally get them. Now, on the other hand, predators, when they travel in groups, have a greater chance of getting prey. So it works both ways. Prey have a better chance of surviving in large groups. Predators have a better chance of getting food in large groups as well. The next concept that scientists look at for population ecology is to study um, the dynamics of how the population size is changing. Basically, is it staying the same? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? Because when we look at the survivability of the population, then populations that are on the decline, then we need to look at, well, what is causing that decline? So the first thing that we study is, um, is not only just assessing um, where they're at, but where they're going. Now, there are multiple factors that can influence the rate at which a population can grow. The main ways in which a population primarily grows is the birth rate. Obviously, in order to propagate a species, you must have reproductive success. Now, in a species where they're distributed over numerous areas, you can also have the population increase by immigration, where individuals from a different population migrate in and will contribute to the population size as a whole. But that doesn't influence a population as dramatically as the factors of the birth uh, rate. So primarily, the growth of a population is primarily affected by uh, the birth rate. Now, we're going to look at what aspects of their, um, the species allow them to grow rapidly, grow slowly. There are certain parameters that, over time, if these change, and this is about evolution as well, species that tend to have different dynamics have different birth rates because of how many offspring they have and how often they can reproduce and all these factors that we're going to go into in a little bit. And that's really where I'm going to focus in most of the questions is how changes in the number of offspring they have per reproductive cycle influences their population growth rate. Does it increase it? Does it decrease it? Um, so it's fairly simplistic, but we're going to look at all these factors. Now, obviously, we also look at the factors that take away from the population's overall growth rate, and that is death. Um, pr the primary reason and why a population ultimately declines. Now, we're also going to show a little bit later on what are some of the things that limit how fast the population can grow as well as factor into how much death is in a population. And a lot of that comes down to um, uh, resources in the area, predation, and other types of things. Um, emigration is where individuals move out of the population and that also subtracts from the population as a whole. But just like immigration, it doesn't play as large a role in the overall dynamic of how fast the population grows, but it does contribute to that. So really, it comes down to the birth to death ratio in any species on how fast they're, they're growing. If we look at the human species, we see a huge dynamic uh, across the world in different countries and different cultures where in some areas they're growing quite rapidly. In other areas, like here in the US, we pretty much have what we call replacement reproduction. I think our reproductive rate is like 0.1%. So we don't have as uh, hardly any growth at all within the United States. In China, where you might actually think because of the number of individuals you would have a larger growth rate, in fact, is on the decline and some other areas as well have a declining population growth rate. Now this is not due necessarily to space issues or things of that sort, but rather more um, political and, and other factors that come into play. So when we deal with people, things start to get a little more messy. So we're primarily gonna deal with plants and animals uh, um, and not necessarily people because we start making things a little more uh, uh, messed up with our uh, psychology. However, one of the big concerns that we have, and this is going to be a, a, a different question a little bit later on, or related to a different question later on, is at what point can the human population as a whole in the entire world, at what point will we not be sustainable? Because okay? every environment limits the number of individuals that can reside within that area based upon the availability of space, food, water, things of that sort. So the big question that scientists have, 
as well as others have, is at what point will we reach what's called the carrying capacity? Now, humans have the ability to supersede the natural carrying capacity of any environment primarily because of our ability to live in God-forsaken areas, um, <laughs> like a desert, you know, here in Utah or something, um, where in reality, the amount of food that we produce um, locally is would only sustain about 10% of the current population of Utah. 90% of the food is shipped in from other places. Now, due to modern industry and technology, we are able to live in areas that normally would not be able to support such a large population. And so that's ultimately why we have this huge spike in growth in the overall uh, population of our species because of the ability to ship food elsewhere uh, and, and live in places that we normally wouldn't uh, be able to have such a high density of individuals. Now, we've had our setbacks especially in the Europe where we had the bubonic plague and the pneumonic plague where we had a huge dip due to the uh, many, many individuals that died. Ultimately, because of the Industrial Revolution, our growth has spiked and that's why it concerns a lot of individuals is because this can't go on indefinitely. There is a point where we will not have enough food in order to be able to sustain that large of a population. Okay, so that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit later on about carrying capacity. That will be the concept that I'm going to test you on. But that's the concern, is every environment, every uh, area that houses a population of any species has a limitation of resources. It's not unlimited. You don't have unlimited space. You don't have unlimited um, food production and water availability and things of that sort. Now, let's talk about life strategies or the ability for a species to reproduce. What are the factors that ultimately go into their um, reproductive success? Now, remember we talked about there's two main ways in which organisms reproduce, sexually and asexually. Some can do both, some can do only one. Typically, organisms that reproduce asexually grow much faster. The reason for that is because um, a lot of asexual reproduction is done by smaller organisms, single-celled organisms, and things of that sort. Typically, if you're a sexually reproducing species, you tend to be on, uh, uh, take a little bit longer for your reproductive cycles. Now, that's not universally true. There are some species that reproduce asexually that are slower in their reproductive cycles than species that reproduce sexually. So, but on the whole, sexually reproducing species tend to have slower growth rates versus individuals that clone themselves. Lifespan also tends to have a correlation, not necessarily a causation, but a correlation where longer lived organisms have a lot more time in which they can be reproductively active and successful, in which case they tend to be slower in their reproductive rates than individuals that have a very, very short lifespan. Uh, that's one of the strategies that they've developed is that they don't live very long, so they have to reproduce very rapidly in order to sustain that population and that species. Now, this is a correlative effect, not a causative effect. And the reason why I make that distinction is because it, in the next few scenarios that we go over, there are evolutionary changes within closely related species that we've shown that due to these slight changes in when they reach sexual maturity, how many offspring they have, and things of that sort, that actually increases or decreases the rate at which the population grows as a whole. And so when we look at those genetic changes, ultimately we can say, oh, if this were to change, then this population would actually grow a little bit faster. What it doesn't say is if all of a sudden the lifespan increases or decreases of the species, that's not going to cause the species to reproduce more rapidly or less rapidly, okay? So though there's a correlative effect between the lifespan, there's not a causative effect that all of a sudden, you know, humans did not live as long as we're living today. That doesn't mean that we sped up our reproductive cycles um, or, or slowed them down for any reason. Uh, it ultimately means we've had some changes in our ability to sustain life and things of that sort. Same thing here. Just because an individual reproduces sexually 
uh, if all of a sudden, this rarely happens, I can't even think of a scenario, but if all of a sudden they were to revert to asexual reproduction, it wouldn't necessarily mean that the species would start growing faster. So there's not a correlation or a causation, I should say, between changing their mode of reproduction, which really just doesn't happen. Now, let's talk about some of the things that are causative. Age at which the species reaches sexual maturity. Um, they've shown in closely related species, such as uh, eagles, that when they reach sexual maturity really has a dramatic effect on the population um, growth rate. For example, they show that two species of eagles, one reaches reproductive uh, age at like four years, another one reaches reproductive age at six years. If you were to compare the growth rate of these two species, the one that reaches the sexual maturity at age or uh, at four years old, uh, ultimately that species has 30 times the rate of reproduction than the other. They grow, they, they as a population, um, essentially uh, reproduce 30 times faster just because of that two year difference in their age of maturity. So when we look at these factors, these are the things that we're um, uh, concerned about as far as how fast the population will grow. You'll see how all this relates to the survivability of a species and their possible extinction, which is what we're primarily concerned about. Now, when and how often it reproduces. Some species only reproduce once in their entire lifetime. And, you know, they reproduce and then they die shortly thereafter. Other species have a small window in which they can reproduce. And others have a huge window in which they can reproduce. So obviously, the more time a species has in their reproductive cycle, the more rapidly the species will um, grow as a whole. The less time they have for reproductive cycles, the, the slower they're going to grow. Number and size of offspring. How long does it take for the uh, organisms to uh, go through a, a reproductive cycle? For example, uh, with people, it's about nine months. With um, elephants, it's over a year. Poor elephants. Um, once they get pregnant before the elephant is ready to be born, it takes over a year for them to uh, have their offspring. And then the number of offspring. Mice, I've seen uh, one mouse drop as many as 11 pups uh, <laughs> in one reproductive cycle. Mice ovulate every three days too. So they have sex and they get pregnant essentially. Um, and those, that plays a huge role as far as how fast um, these organisms can grow. Now let's look at the, the death aspect of it. Ultimately, every area has that carrying capacity, those factors which limit how much a population can grow. So we look first at what the reproductive strategy of the population is and how fast they grow based upon the parameters we just talked about. And then we look at what factors are keeping the population size down to a certain point. Well, there's two mechanisms in play in any given environment. We have what we call density dependent factors and density independent factors. And in fact, we've already gone over these. What are they? They're the biotic and abiotic components of natural selection. Basically, the living and the non-living factors that ultimately cause evolution through natural selection. But in this situation, when we look at their effect, we look at ultimately what effect they have on the population's density. So the density dependent factors are ones in where if the density of the population is small, then these factors are also small in their influence. But the larger a population becomes, the more these factors play a role in keeping the population size down. So as one increases, so does the other. As one decreases, as far as the population growth, um, so does the other. Now, what were the factors that we talked about? Predation, competition, parasitism. These are the living components of natural selection that are also what we call density dependent factors. For example, the more individuals in an area, the less resources per individual there are and therefore competition increases dramatically. The fewer individuals there are, the more resources there are per individual and so competition decreases. So that's why it's called a density dependent factor is because as the population increases in size, so does competition 
cause an increase in death rate, which keeps the population size down. Parasitism. Parasites spread faster when the population is large. So you saw that in the video also with the cordyceps fungi, that when a population gets extremely large, they're very susceptible to parasitic infection and spreading of a disease. Whereas if the population is really small, there's less likelihood of it spreading and wiping out uh, a species. And then of course predation. The predator-prey relationship. As the prey population goes up, the predators have more to eat and their population goes up. As the prey population goes down, then so does the predator population. In fact, you'll find that these two correlative events are cyclical in nature. You'll see one kind of trailing right behind the other as far as their population growth rate and their death. Now this doesn't happen over the series of a couple of months. Uh, it usually happens over decades where we see this increase and decrease. We see these uh, fluctuations in the density of these populations. But the correlation is still there. The more prey there are, the more predation there is. The less prey there are, the less predation there is. So those are the density dependent factors. Now, density independent factors. These are factors that will happen no matter what the density of the population is. So the population, as it increases, this doesn't influence the density independent factors. What are we talking about? We're talking about the weather, the temperature, the rainfall, any type of natural disasters. They're not caused by or influenced by the density of the population. So let's say one year you have you know, 10 inches of rainfall and the next year you have two feet of rainfall and you saw that the population had increased you know, from one year to the other by you know, 10%. That increase in the population didn't make it rain more, okay? So that's why it's called density independent factors. Isn't that kind of the premise though of global warming? On a global scale, um, it has more to do with how the ecosystems are, are influencing one another rather than any one individual. Though there are situations where in a local area, especially because of us, we can have differences in you know, inversion and, and pollution and other types of things. So whenever humans get brought into the thing, it just kind of screws it all up. But when you look at like just the normal circumstances of the squirrels and the birds and all that kind of stuff, they're not going to directly influence. But yes, you're right in the sense that other factors are influencing um, rainfall and weather and other things that uh, um, not only natural but man-made as well uh, contributing so all of these things come into play but on a individual scale when we look at individual populations no one population is really um, going to increase or make it more likely that the, vol uh, the volcano is going to erupt okay so these natural disasters, changes in temperature and weather and things of that sort, ultimately can wipe out 90% of the population, whether you have a thousand individuals or a million individuals. It doesn't matter. It's going to destroy or change the dynamics of the area independent of what the population size is. So these are the factors that ultimately cause the death to increase. Competition increases death, predation increases death, parasite spreading increases death, natural disasters increase death. So ultimately, organisms find a balance between their environment and how fast they're growing and how much death there is. Um, and like I said, each environment has what we call a carrying capacity. Uh, where there's a finite number of uh, uh, resources, food, space, water, and even energy. I, I like to separate food and energy because when I say food, we usually think of organisms consuming one another, whether it's a vegetarian or whether it's a carnivore or whatnot, or decomposition. And when I say energy, I'm usually talking about photosynthetic activity, which is also a resource for specific organisms. And so that's why I say food and energy is kind of two separate things, but it just looks at how they're getting that. So what happens is, if the population grows rapidly enough, it's eventually going to reach that limit of resources. And this is what I was saying in the beginning about uh, the human population. We're in this exponential growth phase. We're in this phase where we're still growing very rapidly. So the question becomes, when are we going to hit that carrying capacity? And that's, there's a lot of debate on that. But once you hit it, 
then what happens is due to the competition for resources and the limitation of space, the death rate increases dramatically, thus leveling off the population's ability to grow beyond that and it will dip down below. So usually right here in the middle of this wave is where the carrying capacity is actually at. As you go below it, then the resources, more resources become available, the population will start growing into that and they'll overshoot them and so on and so forth. So eventually they stabilize with the carrying capacity of the environment. Now on a local level, this is what plants and animals are restricted to. But since we humans have the ability to, to supersede the individual carrying capacity of any one environment, that's why the world is our oyster, so to speak. And we still have that question, when are we going to reach that? Now, two main strategies um, for any species exist in terms of the general characteristics as the population approaches carrying capacity. Some species tend to grow slowly and reach carrying capacity in almost an indiscernible manner. Others grow so rapidly that they overshoot the carrying capacity and then they have huge fluctuations in their population. And when we analyze what their overall growth rate is, then we can see whether or not these species are in danger primarily by you know, all of these factors combined. So let me give you the, the general outline. There are pretty much two types of life history patterns for organisms. They're either opportunistic populations in an ecological sense or equilibrium populations. And these are the general characteristics for these groups of organisms. Now this is not restricted to any one kingdom or domain. These are just how we classify or separate two types of organisms in any ecosystem to be able to see what effect they have on that ecosystem. For example, opportunistic populations are on the whole small organisms. They mature very early for sexual reproduction. They tend to have very short lifespans and my favorite, wish we had this, limited parental care of offspring. They don't take care of their young as often as, as much as uh, other organisms do. Now, because of these factors, they tend to exhibit what we call exponential growth, which is what I showed you before. That's that non-linear growth where it starts growing very, very rapidly and building exponentially upon itself. Ultimately, this can't happen indefinitely, but you're dealing primarily with small organisms, rabbits, mice, um, uh, bacteria, uh, these are the organisms that make use of the resources available. Now, before you think that this is a bad thing, it's actually a really good thing because there are periods of time where resources are so abundant that they have to be used up very rapidly. And these are the organisms that will take that opportunity, which is why we call them opportunistic, to get the nutrients as fast as they possibly can. Now, on the other side of the coin, equilibrium populations, these tend to bring stability to an ecosystem. Why? Because they're pretty much the opposite. They have much slower growth called logistic growth. Okay? Logistic growth is one that happens, um, it can happen you know, somewhat rapidly from a perspective of you know, comparing other species, but on the whole, they grow very slowly. We're talking about large animals here. They, they have very few offspring per reproductive cycle, very few reproductive cycles, long lifespan. And so they're pretty much the opposite. They take care of their young forever, <clears throat> as it seems. Um, and so uh, we belong to that. And uh, ecosystem needs both of these. They need the ones that can use up the resources very rapidly, but they also need the stabilizers, the ones that can actually remain from year to year and don't fluctuate too much in their overall population size. How do we bring all this together? Well, the big question that we study and ask with population ecology is, is the species going extinct? Okay, so we have to look at a number of factors to be able to determine whether the species will continue to thrive in that environment or whether they're on the decline and will eventually go extinct. Okay? And why are we concerned about that? Because as you'll learn in the next lecture after spring break, when a species goes extinct, if that species is key for the stability of the ecosystem, then the ecosystem can collapse. 
And this is the big concern for climate change is that if changing conditions in these various ecosystems change dramatically enough, species may not be able to survive the rapid changes and if you wipe out certain key species, you destroy the ecosystem. And this is a very real danger that we have um, with these various uh, um, uh, regions, which is why it's a big concern today. Now, the three primary factors, this doesn't mean other things aren't considered, but the three primary factors that we look at for the species and whether or not we put them on the endangered species list are as follows. The first one is the size of their geographical range. What do I mean by that? Well, humans are not really in any danger of going extinct because we live everywhere, okay? So we have so many different places in which we can reside, then we don't have a small geographical range. But there are some species that reside in one forest, in one part of the world, and nowhere else. That is the first warning sign because they typically can't survive in other conditions. They have to be the right temperature, uh, there has to be the right dynamics, you know, all of these factors have to come together. And if they're restricted to a certain geographical range, that's a danger, that's a warning sign that they may go extinct. Now, that by itself is not enough. And then we look at another factor, what we call a degree of habitat tolerance. This is their ability to evolve. So how do we determine their degree of habitat tolerance? Well, we ultimately determine it by their genetic variation. The more genetically diverse the species is, the greater chances they have of surviving changes in the conditions. The less genetically uh, diverse they are, the next less genetic variation they have, the more susceptible they are to dying off. And this is the case with uh, uh, organisms like whales. Uh, because of our predation of them, over the years, there is such little diversity among some species of whales that when their habitat changes, because it will, as it always does uh, over the years, um, they're very likely to go extinct. They will not have the ability to adapt to, to major changes in their habitat. And then the third and final is, comes down to the size of the population. Okay? And this is what we've been talking about for pretty much the whole lecture is we look at reproductive strategies, how fast they grow, how, uh, um, uh, how much death there is, ultimately comes down to how many of the individuals are there. If there are a few hundred, that's a warning sign. If there are a few million, uh, we're not too worried. Now, sometimes we put species on the watch list. That's usually when they have a couple of these, but when they have all three, where there's not very many individuals left, they only inhabit a particular region in the world, and they have very little genetic diversity, that's when we put them on the endangered species list. They're most likely going to go extinct. Now, sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's just the way things work. If you look at the fossil records on our planet, 99.9% .9 of the species that have lived on our planet are dead. So change happens. Species evolve. And if they can't evolve, they go extinct. They die off. So what our concern is, are we causing it? We have to ask the question, are we causing the extinction of these species and can we do something about it? And those are the questions that we really should be asking, is what influence do we have on these? Remember, each species has its reproductive strategy. Some are exponential, some are opportunistic, but that's not the factor we look at to determine whether or not they're gonna go extinct. Just because a species only has one offspring and, and grows once a year, uh, or, uh, you know, has one offspring every year and has this reproductive cycle doesn't mean they're going to go extinct because there's not really a correlation there. There is a correlation between how many individuals there are, their size of uh, their habitat, and ultimately their ability to adapt. Those are the things that uh, give us the warning signs that they may not survive, okay? Because each organism has their strategies. Now, obviously, if they have very few individuals, but they grow very rapidly, then we might say, oh, they may come back. So ultimately though, these are the three factors that we use to determine whether or not they're at risk of becoming extinct. So yes, we do include population growth rate when analyzing the population, but it's not one of those things that we say, oh, they grow really slowly, so they're endangered of dying off. No, that's, that's not the the, the assessment.